we have a T-Rex. Oh. Put, your, put your head between your knees. <laughs> a safari park where you get to see real dinosaurs larking about sounds like fun and all, so long as absolutely nothing goes wrong. But here's a film about a dinosaur safari park where things not only go wrong, but also askew, bung, awry, balls up, and, if I may, a little caca. I got in the power. Yeah, I didn't say I was scared. I didn't say you were scared. I know. Welcome to Jurassic Park. There's a dinosaur. <laughs> Steven Spielberg's 1993 film Jurassic Park is one of those movies. One of those dividing lines where there's before Jurassic Park and after Jurassic Park. Before Jurassic Park, dinosaurs on screen were one of those things that were pretty much guaranteed to enthrall small kids, but make everyone else just a little dismissive of how they were realized on screen. Whether it's men in suits, puppets, stop motion photography, or whatever. Dinosaurs were generally avoided by serious filmmakers who didn't want their work sullied by unflattering appraisals of the effects work. Then Jurassic Park came along, heralding a visual effects revolution. Yet at the same time, it's also a pretty cool movie in its own right. One that would become a massive success and spawn a number of sequels that somehow managed to be more and more disappointing. Yet they still make about as much money as that Twitch streamer you really hate. You know the one, the really obnoxious one who shouts a lot. What do you mean that doesn't narrow it down? Dinosaurs uh, uh, had their shot and nature selected them for extinction. Jurassic Park began as a novel by Michael Crichton that was first published in 1990, with an idea that seems, conceptually at least, to be revisiting the exact same themes as the screenplay for his 1973 film Westworld, which was about visitors to a theme park full of robots that went wrong. Jurassic Park is more than Michael Crichton doing a find and replace where he swaps all mentions of robots with dinosaurs. I think. Look, I'm 90% sure. 80%. Look, high 60s, definitely. Maybe it's a coin toss. Alan Grant is a paleontologist, his partner Ellie Sattler a paleobotanist. The pair's discovery of velociraptor fossils will have to wait. I mean, they're not going anywhere. After their benefactor John Hammond shows up with a proposition. He needs some experts to give his latest project the stamp of approval. And so, with the promise of further funding, which is not in any way a bribe, they all head off to his tropical island. They meet up with the lawyer Gennaro, representing investors in the project, and the mathematician Ian Malcolm who represents random pauses and strange grunts. <laughs> On the island they'll find, well, there's no way to sugarcoat this, actual fucking dinosaurs wandering about. They see Brachiosaurus, a triceratops with a tummy ache, and even a baby velociraptor hatching. Gennaro sees dollar signs. We can charge anything we want, 2,000 a day, 10,000 a day, and people will pay it. Alan and Ellie are overcome with emotion at being made redundant. We're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? And Ian Malcolm does his best to tell everybody why they are wrong. I mean, Ian Malcolm is set up as a charming and sexy dinner party guest, but one that will likely make you set your own house on fire just to get him to change the subject. Malcolm also spends his time hitting on Ellie when he's not waxing lyrical about portents of doom, which is some kind of strategy, I suppose. Alan's worst nightmare becomes real. Not having a mobile sex beast chatting up his lady, nor the fact his job has been rendered pointless, not even the scientific and ethical considerations of reconstituting a long extinct species. Nope, Alan has to share a tour with some kids. Hammond's grandchildren Lex, who's interested in computers. I prefer to be called a hacker. And Tim. The latter happens to be a kid who's read everything about dinosaurs. His book was a lot fatter than yours. It was like, really? like this. Yours was fully illustrated. On the tour, they'll see various dinosaurs. But the T-Rex seems to be in hiding, which seems like it would be the reason that most guests at the park will eventually leave negative reviews on Yelp. Ellie helps with a sick triceratops, while Malcolm predicts the quality of the sequels that will inevitably follow this film. That is one big pile of shit. Hammond's intentions for bringing back dinosaurs seems to be one of curiosity, and, well, it might be a fun safari park that'll make a mozza. So long as absolutely nothing of any consequence ever, ever goes wrong in the slightest. Well, hello, Newman. Computer programmer Dennis is going to sell Jurassic Park's secrets, and part of his escape involves a little temporary sabotage of the park's security that's also hopefully covered by a storm. With the power out, the tour stops, as do the electrical fences, which means... Holy shit! 
Tyrannosaurus Rex attacks the stranded tour group. The lawyer Gennaro of the law firm Weasel, Snake and Rat is the first victim. Don't move! Can't see us if we don't move. Look, if you're stuck in a situation where a dinosaur attacks, who better to get you out of it than a guy who knows absolutely the behaviour of dinosaurs? Someone like Alan Grant, who is now the dude. Alan has to rescue the kids and protect them as they make their way back to the park's main buildings. While Hammond is trying to get the park's computer systems online with Ellie, the park ranger Muldoon, and another programmer, the chain-smoking Ray. Let's just say, things do not go well for many of them. Dennis is killed by one dinosaur, ending his attempt at industrial sabotage in an ironic way. Muldoon is cornered by a group of raptors before being... Ooh. And Ray ends up being disarmed in a completely different way. When everybody still intact is back at the main building, the Velociraptors strike, chasing the kids, before everyone is saved by the T-Rex taking out the raptors. Okay. Jurassic Park was a movie that has a killer premise and was massively helped by outstanding special effects. But then there are lots of movies with a good premise and great special effects. Where Jurassic Park differs is that, for the most part, you become invested in the characters. Oh, hello? Yes? I really hate that man. You want Alan and Ellie to survive. You want the kids to survive. No, really, you want the kids to survive. You also want Hammond's Park to work out because, you know, you want to go there yourself just so long as the 90% chance of guaranteed horrible death can be ironed down to something more manageable. You know, something like about 8 to 10% tops. T-Rex? Mm-hmm. You said you've got a T-Rex? Uh-huh. Say again. Sam Neill and Laura Dern make engaging leads for a film like this. When you act with special effects, you have to make the audience believe that you can actually see what's not even going to be added for months. So mission accomplished. Jeff Goldblum gives one of his most charismatic performances in what's pretty much a supporting role. He chews up every line of dialogue and owns every scene he's in. And while he was already a popular actor, in time he'd become an icon. He of the memes. Uh, well, there it is. Richard Attenborough was a classic actor in films like The Great Escape, who later turned into a director of epic films like A Bridge Too Far and Gandhi. Wayne Knight, well, of course, he was always going to play a duplicitous character. Edge of Darkness star Bob Peck is, of course, eaten, but he at least gets one of the film's best non-Jeff lines. Clever girl. The kids are fine, played by Ariana Richards and Joe Mazzello, later to appear in The Pacific and Bohemian Rhapsody. It's a unique system. Child actors are always a coin toss as to whether they will work in a film, but here having one of the few blockbuster directors who knew how to work with child actors of course helps enormously. And of course, we have the obligatory appearance by the man himself. Hold on to your butts. In one of the very last movies where you would go, oh, Samuel L. Jackson was in that, I didn't know that. It could have been worse, John. A lot worse. Michael Crichton's work is often exemplified by warnings of how technology could go bad by showing us technology going bad as part of the plot and hoping that audiences would connect the dots in their own mind. In the case of Jurassic Park, Crichton literally has a character articulate all of the points he wanted to make rather than have the story do the work. He's probably right to do so because sometimes you need to be utterly literal to get through to some folks. How literal? As literal as a sledgehammer because you need a sledgehammer to crack nuts. Steven Spielberg was the name to have on a film in the 80s, either as a director or as a producer. His Amblin logo grazed so many classic films of that decade that it's hard to remember a time when he wasn't printing money for movie studios. In 1993, he would release Jurassic Park and the Holocaust drama Schindler's List, with each becoming huge hits. It was while he was filming Schindler's List in Europe that he was also having to approve the dinosaur film's groundbreaking special effects. Really spectacular, spared no expense. Dinosaurs have long fascinated people, well, the ones who read dinosaur books. And indeed, many kids go through the annoying dinosaur phase, like Tim in the film. After the events of Jurassic Park, Tim having been zapped and chased by numerous killer dinosaurs, look, I just wonder how he'll feel about them later in between the bedwetting and the therapy sessions. <sighs> Steven Spielberg loved dinosaurs, so when there was a bidding war for the film rights to Crichton's book, Universal was the highest bidder, with the express intention of Spielberg directing a Jurassic Park movie for the studio. 
despite him already planning to make Schindler's List. As part of the green light for that film, Spielberg agreed to make Jurassic Park first. Hold on to your butts. There was one just tiny little detail. How in the living hell were they going to make the dinosaurs? The original idea was a two-pronged attack. Close-ups would use animatronic puppets where an army of operators would bring to life the various dinosaurs. And for long shots where you saw the animal moving in full, traditional stop motion would be utilised. Here, articulated models are filmed one frame at a time before being moved slightly and then another frame is taken. That method was famously used to animate the original King Kong, various creature films of the 1950s, the 8080s in Empire Strikes Back, and yes, even the odd dinosaur or two. Ray Harryhausen had become a household name with his credits as a special effects supervisor being remembered more than the directors of the films that used his work. Stop motion is great, but it has its drawbacks in that motion can look a little jerky without some extra techniques to help simulate things like motion blur. ILM was slated to handle the effects with animator Phil Tippett overseeing the stop motion scenes. However, in another corner of ILM, a few artists in Dennis Murin's department had made test scenes using computer models. While some small amount of computer enhancement was always planned, everything changed once Steven Spielberg saw the CG tests. Shh, shh, don't the monsters come over here? They're not monsters, Lex, they're just animals, and these are herbivores. And just like that, stop motion as the main way to realize the dinosaurs in long shots was as dead as, oh, what's the name of those creatures that have been dead for ages? It's on the tip of my tongue, Star Wars fans. No, wait, it's the origin story for gasoline. Yes, dinosaurs. Stop motion was now as dead as a dinosaur. While some animators saw the writing on the wall, others embraced the new technology, though stop motion animatics were still used as a pre-visualization tool. But while this film is known for CG busting through, it is worth remembering we are seeing a mix of CG and puppet effects. CG for long shots involving motion and puppets for the close-ups. So this is a computer graphic shot, this is a puppet. Computer, puppet, puppet, computer, puppet, gold balloon, computer, puppet, and so on. There is a sub-genre, actually it's a sub-sub-genre, which mixes horror and science fiction. The film's theme, or maybe the motivation, is the revenge of nature, which you see in movies with swarms of creatures attacking humans. It might be humans versus one giant beast like Spielberg's own film Jaws, or films like King Kong or Godzilla, or it's humans against swarms of creatures attacking people like the birds. These sorts of films were very popular in the 70s as B flicks, but here Spielberg turns a B into an A+. Doubling for the fictional Isla Nublar, supposedly off the coast of Costa Rica, were various locations in Hawaii, with the rest of the film shot on Universal sound stages in Burbank. Uncle Reg was also once shot on the Universal lot, but then he does tend to get shot a lot. The bread raptors. When he was firing on every cylinder, few directors could match Steven Spielberg for getting the most out of every scene, from camera placement to just telling the story efficiently and getting the most out of his actors. My teacher told me about this other book by a guy named Backer, and he... This film is a masterclass in tension, in plotting, and putting in a few PG-13 friendly scares. In Jurassic Park, Spielberg was metaphorically, but thankfully not medically, shitting gold. Also, if you or a loved one are literally passing precious metals in your stool, please seek medical attention and or independent financial advice. After careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. John Williams delivered another fine score in what would become one of the decade's most iconic movie themes. Look, there are two good things about John Williams scores. Firstly, they are amazing. And secondly, I can use the phrase decade's most iconic themes in any video about a movie scored by this legend. I will say this though, I didn't love the film originally. I liked it enough, but I didn't love it. But as I've watched it more and more, I've been appreciating it more and more as time goes on to the point where I absolutely love the first Jurassic Park movie. It's one of those rare movies where everybody was having a really good day doing their best work. If there is a weak link, if there's anything to criticize, it's probably that this kid that doesn't look very scary more like a six foot turkey wasn't somehow magically transported to the island to be eaten by velociraptors jurassic park would be a smash hit the box office champ of 1993 we're gonna make a fortune and would redefine the tools available to filmmakers 
which, like any tool, can be used for good and bad. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. There was a merchandising bonanza, and the film, of course, would spawn many sequels. Uh, again, for good and for bad. How can we possibly have the slightest idea of what to expect? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. <laughs> See, here I am now by myself, uh, uh, talking to myself. That's, that's chaos theory.